Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. This is an act of collective thinking. And it's the act of collective thinking of a, a very unusual community, we think. First of all, it's a global community, um, a group of people who are deeply engaged in policy design and policy implementation in their various countries and jurisdictions from around the world. Uh, but they are people who, in doing that work, often in very public glare of, public, of publicity and uh, focus, are at heart deeply dissatisfied with what they're doing. And they are all part of the global school improvement movement. Uh, but they know that however sharp we are at improving our existing school system, actually it is not going to deliver what we need. Why? Because that system was designed for a quite different age. It's resilient, it's very good at improving, we've learnt a lot about how to do that. But fundamentally it's clamped within a certain set of parameters which were about a different world. And our world has changed so fundamentally. Demographically, socially, economically, it's globalised in ways that even two decades ago we could never have guessed. And its economic foundations are frail, as we know only too well. Across the world, 300 million young people are unemployed. And the economists and the uh, uh, labour statisticians tell us that our schooling systems, our education systems, are not preparing young people with the skills that they need and the employers say they want, or to regenerate our economies in ways that are sustainable and lead to increasing prosperity and good lives. So, the final part to say about our changed world is it has become a digital age. That shows a digital age. Those processes, those organisations, hardly even existed two years ago. And yet they now are the kind of age within or the, 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 the nature of our social existence, particularly familiar to young people, but which have hardly changed the schooling system at all. It has not adapted. So the community to which we authors here belong have been thinking about what it might mean to adapt to this world. The Global Education Leaders Programme is the collective author of the book, which I hope you'll take a, a longer look at. Thank you. Um, you'll see from the map that the system leaders who are members of it are distributed across all continents. There are 12 jurisdictions, ranging from high-achieving, highly ambitious jurisdictions such as South Korea and Finland, to emergent economies with high ambitions for their education systems, Brazil, India, as well as all between. Uh, the Global Education Leaders Programme have come together to work together and to think about how our system needs to change fundamentally, not just improve at the margins, to meet the needs of our young learners. In other words, to equip every learner for success in the 21st century. And for shorthand, we've called that Education 3.0. 1.0 is when we managed access. 2.0 is when we thought about school improvement and got pretty good at it. 3.0 is when we start to move towards a different and we hope transformed paradigm. In our journey through GELP, through the Global Education Leaders Programme, we sort of encountered a half a dozen myths about scale and diffusion. Um, I don't want to share all of them, I'll just share three of them with you today. And the first one is sort of illustrated by the slide behind me. The basic method in which governments and school districts networks have tried to spread great practice is by shouting about it. Well, actually not shouting, but glossy pamphlets, flashy websites, ever bigger exhibitions. And yet all the research and experience around the world shows that pamphlets, websites and exhibitions are of limited effectiveness. And yet, we still think the megaphone is the best way in which to do this. The second myth is that what we want to do is perfect our practice and then think about how we take it out to scale. So if we could just create a few more really great schools and then spread out that practice across a country or a district or a city or whatever it may be, then that will work. So we have in innovation first and then diffusion. 
innovation first and then taking it to scale, pilots and then rolling them out. Again, the evidence of this is that it is relatively ineffective as a process of scaling and diffusion. And thirdly, and perhaps most contentiously, we believe that the best way to do this is through teachers, that teachers are the best agents of diffusion. In fact, we can see through research and experience are all of limited effectiveness. So in this journey of the Global Education Leaders Program, actually different mechanisms and methods and processes have been developed by people in chains and networks of schools, by system leaders that are beginning to show more promise in how we can take this forward. Firstly, that the act of developing new practices, of more powerful practices, practices which increase and improve the life and life chances and educational outcomes of students and young people. The ways in which this is best done is not through individual schools doing this, but indeed through creating collaborations between groups of schools. Collaborations between those schools which may be further advanced and those schools which are early adopters. These have many names around the world. Secondly, and probably even more uh, seriously for many systems around the world, has been we've concentrated on pushing out the ideas and practices. What we're learning through GELT, what we're learning through the real experience of system leaders, of school leaders around the world, is the most important part is about mobilizing the demand. Whenever voice is given to students, we find students demanding changes in educational practices. So that as well as working, of course, through networks of teachers, mobilizing students, mobilizing parents, mobilizing higher education, mobilizing employers to give voice to the dissatisfaction with the present and the encouragement of new models and practices is critically important, particularly to those most dissatisfied, most disengaged students, where the disengaged students are, often aren't just those who are underachieving, but indeed a growing community of high achieving students who are themselves disengaged. But finally, what all this adds up to is a very different mindset, not a mindset of government and system leaders orchestrating change, but in a sense, catalyzing social movements, bringing together the parents, the students, the communities, the businesses, the private sector and the public sector in a social movement that advances 21st century education. But of course, diffuse, diffusion scaling these practices uh, are only some elements of a transformational journey. But there are many elements to a transformational journey. There are many different aspects that have to be considered. It's a set of interdependent elements that people need to consider. It's difficult, challenging, and not just complicated, but complex work. It requires courage and determination. It requires skill and artfulness. It's also the case that what the jurisdictions in the Global Education Leaders Program have found is that they need roadmaps. These are frameworks within which different districts, different countries, different cities can think about the sequencing and relationships between the different elements. A roadmap, people have found, helps them plot and replot that journey. It's not something fixed, it's something they learn through, something that helps review progress, that guides the journey, that captures the learning, that enrolls key others. So there's no one right pathway, but we have also learned there are many wrong ones. Uh, there are some false polarities, polarities between subjects and skills, polarities between curriculum and assessment, polarities between standards and structures, all of which may indeed be false polarities in thinking about what the nature of education needs to be in the 21st century. But I want to return, to just finish before we open it up, to a point that Valerie made right at the beginning. This is not an argument for saying that all the energies of all the people in all systems should be devoted to the transformation that is required to achieve 21st century. I'll take Chair's prerogative just to yeah. pose a question to you, because I guess my... Um, at the risk of being the Luddite uh, in, in the room, I have to say I'm sceptical about some of the talk about 21st century education. I am not convinced 
that the fundamental business of learning has shifted. It seems to me it's one of the kind of a conceit of modernity that we think that life is so different in the 21st century that it was. There has always been change. And in the book, you say, you list the TES discussions in 2011 about what's the purpose of education and go on to say it would have been entirely different 20 years ago. Mm, not really. And I think those people who are in schools would say that a lot of that is actually fundamentally the same and it's about equipping young people with the skills that they need. And in essence, they haven't changed so much. Yes, at the margins. But I just want to sort of push a bit more. And precisely then, when you're talking about the ratios, if you're looking, and I'm obviously connected with working in some of the most difficult and disadvantaged areas in the country, if you're looking there, I have to say school improvement looms much larger in sort of our lives than the radical transformation. And if you're talking simply about resources in an austere climate, where's that balance? You're talking about equality, a balance between improvement and yeah. innovation. My... Uh comment, I think, uh, Lucy, to your point, is that in this country and in many countries, we are seeing the transformation of the learning in our schools. This goes back to Susan's point about who's leading this transformation. In this country, as in many countries, uh, we are seeing schools confronting the challenges that Valerie outlined and ways of operating in, uh, that I think David has outlined that suggest to me that, as distinct from some of the discourse that takes place at system level, that is not the reality of the change that's happening on the ground. And so my argument would be that in all of the jurisdictions we're working in and in this place, we are seeing significant changes to the way in which we're going about learning. Let me just now make four challenges, okay, um, as we go forward, because we've identified it. So the first slide, yeah. Um, this won't be a surprise, I'm looking at John Bangs. Um, the question about the nature of the profession itself. Quite clearly, if you're talking about uh, multiple players now in the learning game. The question about the nature of the profession, how we think about that, a more differentiated profession, a remodeled workforce. This is language we've been talking about in this country for the last 10 years. And it was one of the first countries to actually shift the balance between those who are perhaps regarded as being the core of the profession and others that support it. But I think in most of the countries that we're working with now, they are thinking very differently about expanding the nature of the educator workforce and the leadership of that workforce. So we could talk more about that. But I do think it is a real challenge for us to think about how that will play itself out in the institutional arrangements of schooling. Next challenge. The more you talk about the way in which you see the learning game opening up from the supply side, and I take it your point about the importance of mobilising the demand side, and often therefore you get the supply response, the more diversity of offering you have. Then when you're seriously concerned about equity, you think seriously about the way in which we are committed in our systems to ensure it's every young person that learns adequately. Then the question, it seems, about new players into the market, low cost providers. I'm just thinking, Simon, about the work of Pearson in developing nations. I'm thinking about Amplify in this country and worldwide or in Bloom in the US, whatever it might be. There are a whole range of players that are coming into this and schools and systems will access that in different ways. But the challenge in big cities, not just rural, remote, indigenous communities, the, the challenge in big, complex cities to ensure that there is an attention to equity, I think is a big challenge for us as we think about the diversity on the supply side in response to a demand side. Third challenge. Let me go to the fourth. Next slide, and I'll come back to this. Yeah. The government issue that we've talked about, and then I want to come back to the politics, OK? So it is pretty clear that if you talk about government in the way that Valerie did in terms of platform, the question about government, and there's a whole value proposition around what the public, the public value proposition really is in this space now about learning. But nonetheless, people in all of our jurisdictions are talking more about brokering and enabling than they are talking about providing and regulating. Now, look, that's a simple throwaway line, and obviously systems are very, are, very, are very complex. But nonetheless, it strikes me that we'll have to get much more sophisticated in thinking about exactly what the task and mission is of learning, how you operate within the authorising environment of government, and how you build organisational capacity with partners to be able to deliver the kind of learning that we're talking about. So it does actually once again bring back into question role of government. And finally, in terms of you know, a work in progress, the politics. I mean, I think this is really the game that all of us understand. If you are in the business of serious change, and that's what we are, 
then the question about how you deal with the culture, the values, the nature of the political system, how those who are agents of change operate within those environments collaboratively, in partnership, in ways that regardless of the nature of the authority structure, that really is what we, I think, as educators, need to take on very seriously. So your question about how do we influence, how do we affect the nature of learning so that government is an enabling factor and force rather than an inhibitor is what we see across all 12 jurisdictions. And we are getting better at figuring out how you influence the authorising environment, how you play the nature of the politics of education in each of our respective countries, respecting the value base and the nature of those cultures. But I do think it's through collaboration, through partnerships, through networks, that in all of the systems, they are saying this is the way forward. You do it together and not just simply within the sector, but across sectors. That's the way in which you actually shift the nature of the learning enterprise. The central premise of this book, of course, as you'll know, is that we need to fundamentally rethink what learning should look like. That's a phrase from the book. It seems to me that that phrase has been, has been proclaimed at various times, certainly throughout the 30 years I've been in education, and of course many times before that. Indeed, any reader of education history, which we often don't do and we should do more often, I think, um, will know that the purpose and value of education has been a constant debate. And people have sat in rooms like this and asked this question at different times, going back to, 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 to Lucy's point. In our age, and we are you know, a generation of educators, in, in our age it's pivoted, seems to me, on, this, on, on the challenge of providing an excellent education for all. We haven't delivered that. The implications of education in post-industrial age for countries like Britain, we certainly have struggled when you look at the performance in the industrial, post-industrial towns of this country. We haven't worked that out. And the impact of the global economy. Um, and as redefining education sets out, how education is increasingly critical to a successful and happy life and thriving competitive economies. And critically, we haven't mentioned this yet, sustainable communities. We're seeing increasingly in migration in communities like Britain, education is fundamental if you're going to build sustainable communities. It seems to me not, not just important, it's not just that education is increasingly important. Thankfully, and this is my very optimistic take on this, some of the old forces of patronage, of protectionism, of exploitation, some of those forces are waning which meant if you were just a child of the elite in Britain, basically you were okay. Our country and our economy would serve you well. Although it happens to be in England, if you're a child of the elite, you still seem to do pretty well. Um, but, 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 but that won't last for long, because the competition of the, the world is opening up in all sorts of, I think, democratic and proper ways. So like it or not, and the book gets to this, this is a global political and competitive agenda. Interestingly, when you read alongside, education isn't alone. If you get the chance, and after you've done the free download, if you get the chance, there's a brilliant book, you may have already read it, I'm sure you have, by Eric Topple, called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. And what Eric does in his book is he explores a similar set of implications from the advance of technology. He talks about the convergence of technology and sets this as the biggest convergence of knowledge, connectivity, and collaboration in the history of humankind, and lays out the implications for medicine, which are profound. It seems to me, and I'm convinced that there, there are great changes happening in the advance of technology, obviously, then it's not that, that this won't, it's not, it won't be any less surprising this is important for education as it is for medicine. In fact, it could be even more important for, for education. But you have to then begin to ask some of the questions. Learning, the two, the two things I want to quickly touch on are learning, the first one is learning and knowing. Um, I, I want to recall a visit I made to Stanbury Primary School, just outside Howarth in Yorkshire. This is, now we're in education, 0.5. Um, <clears throat> as a naive school inspector about 20 years ago, Stanbury, you need to know, at that time had 23 children in the school. Sits right on the edge of the, of the Dales above Howarth. And I went there in my kind of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed way to talk about a, um, a version of the national curriculum. I was met by the head who'd been there, I think, since time, and uh, with, a no with a smile, a knowing nod, and a creak as he opened the cupboard and said, are you talking about this stuff? As these beautifully unopened folders were presented to me. He said, I don't really have much time for any of that. And he said, let's go and see the children. And as we go around, you've got it now, you're going to guess, it was an absolute joy. These were connected classrooms to their communities. They were engaged in what they were doing. They were doing, I'm going to come back to the list later on. I'm going to suggest that these kids in Stanbury were doing all sorts of things that, that we, we talk about in this text quite rightly, picking up on Lucy's point. Mm -hmm. But, and this is the rub, you only had to travel a mile down to Keithley, or where yeah. I really based myself in Manningham in Bradford, yeah. 
to go to many, many classrooms where folksy tales of Dale, Dale's folk, drums, you know, that drops off the agenda, and what you saw made you weep because we fail to teach so many of the children in that part of this country. It's difficult sometimes, almost, to remember the isolation of schools only a few decades ago. And I guess one of the interesting points for me quite right now is that the return to isolation and ignorance is a risk of autonomy and independence. But, you know, I'm sure we're all managing to mitigate that. Improvement now and then demanded that we learn how to look out and learn with each other. Not from each other, I don't think, but with each other, which is quite a different take on it. Redesigning education, the book, Redesigning Education, is a self-attestment to the power and possibilities of connection. I really like the way the book sets out the case for learning ecosystems and the complexity of leadership relationships, providers, connecting infrastructures, and the market. Although it's interesting for me that as we've learned education is more powerful economically, isn't it a surprise that people who previously didn't invest in it are all charging forward to want to support us and help our children learn. Education is a competitive market where people want to own the commodity of knowing and knowledge. And we need to think about that as the leaders and guardians of children. Visiting uh, Babul Ulam Public School in East Delhi last year, the contrast from Stanbury Primary couldn't be greater. I was with teachers using the internet cafe nearby to search for new resources, picking up on lessons teachers had written that are now loaded on the TES teachers website of 600,000 lessons. A young teacher was using her mobile phone in order to capture better pronunciation for phonics lessons she was teaching to these young children. These were teachers who were, and then sharing their lessons, joining a charity to share their innovations with other teachers in India's 1.4 million schools. So teachers are behaving in all sorts of new ways, and I think that, we, that the book's beginning, as, 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 as Resigning Education rightly illustrates, learning ecosystems with new players and new partners at the teacher level as well as the institutional level. But collaboration has to be for a purpose. The book sets out five priorities for Education 3.0, environments, you know, environments that are personal, connected, co-created, collaborative and empowered. I actually don't think Stanbury would argue, and indeed would probably do pretty well on that test. And this is my question at this point. Notwithstanding the changes in technology and the open learning platforms that bring teachers from the world into our classrooms, have the learning priorities for children really changed? And I need someone to set those out for me in a compelling way. Have they really changed? Education systems, my second theme finishing for better learning. Redesigning education sets out the essential skills, of problem solving, decision making, creative and critical thinking, the list you'll know. The list has got to be broadly right set out in the book, and I don't want to argue one list against another. That seems to me arid and facile. But here's the rub. Much of this that we're trying to promote in these new kind of um, ways of learning, rather than the actual learning, the ways of learning, the ways of interacting, uh, we want to see in children, aren't instead of what we were teaching. They're as well as we were teaching. It's more that children have to need to, need to know. We, know. we need teachers to teach better. Not only do, we, do more children need to learn, the impact of failure is more profound. There are no mills at the end of the, the, you know, there are no mills at the end of the valley in Haworth anymore. If you fail in school, it's going to be obviously an enormous struggle. So education exclusion is the great social challenge and the great educational challenge of our age. How can we ensure that we don't give more to those who have and further exclude those who have not? For me, you know, the gospel according to Matthew ought to be the living motto of education and guides us in our thinking. Education inequality, and someone mentioned Brazil, we could talk about a number of the countries, but we could certainly talk about here. Education inequality and the implications for social mobility are the biggest issue that faces our generation of teachers. I read every education book through that lens, and we need to be sure that the changes will improve the attainment of the economically disadvantaged and socially excluded. Change needs to happen differently. It needs to be informed by applying rigorous evaluation and research disciplined innovation, to our colleague's point about creativity in schools, disciplined creativity, disciplined innovation, where we have the evidence that what we're doing makes the difference, actually delivers on improving outcomes, particularly for disadvantaged children. It's great to bring global leaders together. That is absolutely a wonderful idea, but bringing the right people together alone isn't enough. It's the right people doing the right thing that really matters. It's not about who designs change, it's about the methods and evidence used to shape the ideas. I would like to see the ideas and proposals contained in redesigning education tested. And as, Hiller, as, as Valerie said, as the Education Endowment Foundation, it's great that we're involved in testing some of these 
approaches together in rigorous controlled trials. The GELP approach is refreshing. It's great to bring and all too rare to gather leaders, authentic leaders from across the globe to consider questions. This must be a good place to start. Um, and I really like the idea of split screen vision. This is helping me understand my ageing. As, as I go, you know, I'm all over the place. But it's a well-made observation of the challenge in leadership. It's always tempting for leaders uh, to suggest, like everything else, it was harder in our day. I do, however, think that those with experience in leadership now need to concede. It's never been harder, and yet with more possibility and potential. This is because both what's needed and possible, another phrase from the book, is charged with the power and challenge of technology. While I applaud this approach and found insights from the gathering of leaders particularly interesting, I'm left wondering, isn't that in itself a bit old school? Doesn't the change we're considering now bring a broader set of players to the, to the table? Where are the teachers themselves? Where are the parents? Where are the children? These are the players who are going to determine the education of the future. Teach me, parents setting up free schools. This is what's happening, and we need to stay with that pace. I'll leave you with three questions. What is the new learning we're attempting to build? What stops us being the schools we want to be already? And what is the evidence that these approaches suggested will act better for all children? Thank you.